directly in Sri Lanka and looks after Venerable Nana Ponika, his attendant, uh, explains in his um, introduction that he has translated everything, the whole commentary and sub-commentary, whether he thinks it is, if they are uh, valuable or not, in order to not to make judgments. So he has translated all the commentary and all the sub-commentary. And that's why the book has this size. Otherwise, within the long discourses, the Diga Nikaya, it is just another discourse like all the others. But uh, his uh, translations are far more reliable than any of the others which we have available. In the beginning, I will have to tell you something about the background of these people that are playing the, the, um, are the main characters of this sutta. And um, also, you may meanwhile have forgotten what this means in English. Sutta is a discourse, and the Samanapala is a fruit of reclusion. Now, pala is fruit. Samana is the word for recluse. It's a word for a spiritual practitioner, someone who is removing him or herself from the world. In this case, because the question is being asked of the Buddha, it is a removal from the ordinary worldly life for the lifetime. But it can also be considered to be the removal from the world for a period of time. It doesn't have to be, the word does not have to be uh, someone who becomes monk or nun. In this case it is, because the Buddha is of course a monk and this king wants to know about it. But the word itself can mean the fruit of the spiritual life or the recluse life which can be also um, for a period of time. It starts out with, Thus have I heard, which I explained to you yesterday, are the words of Ananda saying, Evam me sutam, Thus have I heard. He is reciting it. On one occasion, the exalted one was dwelling at Rajagaha in Jivaka Komara Bacha's mango grove together with a large company of 1,250 bhikkhus. Now, again, as I told you yesterday, the place is being said, where it took place. It authenticates the whole of the teaching. It is important to have that because one has a much closer relationship. You see, the Buddha's teaching is not just watching one's breath. There's far more to it than that. Watching one's breath is only one aspect of one, no, sorry, of three suttas. That's all. So that he was at Rajagaha in Jivaka Kumara Bhatia of Mango Grove together with a large company of 1250 bhikkhus. Now you'll have to find out who Jivaka Kumara Bhatia is because he's quite an important person in the Buddha's life. He is his personal physician. And his name is Jivaka. And Kumara Bhatia means being brought up by a king. He was an orphan. And he was found abandoned as a tiny little baby. And um, he was brought to the king's court and the royal nurses looked after him. And he grew up very nicely apparently because he was sent to Taxila to study. Now Taxila would have been the very first university that we have any record of. It wasn't a university like we know today. It wasn't a bunch of buildings where people paid their fees and walked in and out of these same buildings all the time and then went home somewhere else to sleep. Uh, in those days, Taxila had many teachers and the students would live with one of the teachers. 
and being taught in all the disciplines that this teacher had to offer. And the teacher was paid, of course. So this Jivaka was sent to Takshila and uh, became a doctor, studied medicine. And apparently he helped the Buddha at one stage with his medicine very much. And the Buddha was grateful to him and gave him um, a discourse on gratitude. Was grateful for the help Jivaka gave him. And during that discourse, Jivaka became a stream enterer. That is, he saw Nibbana for himself for the first time. So he was not only a good physician, but he was also a very good practitioner. And after he became a stream enterer, he decided that he would very much like to attend to the Buddha every day. Would like to see him and listen to him every day. But the nearest monastery where the Buddha was staying sometime was much too far away for him. He couldn't manage that. So he established a new monastery very near to where he himself was living. See, that's one way of getting the teacher there. <laughs> Establish a place and you get the teacher. So that was the mango grove. The mango grove at Rajagaha. And uh, also, interestingly enough, all these places that were established by the followers of the Buddha retained their names like that. This was always called Jivaka's Mango Grove, even though he had given it to the Buddha and offered it, and it was still always called Jivaka's Mango Grove in order to distinguish it between the other places. So this was the place that the Buddha was giving this discourse. Actually, the place can still be seen. There's nothing there. It's just a bare piece of ground with greenery on it. But it has been established where it actually was. It's just right outside of um, Rajagaha. So there's a sign there which says this was either the mango grove. And it also is, uh, says that he, when he established this mango grove, he built numerous kutis so that the Buddha would not uh, refuse to come there because uh, that he would be able to bring all his monks along also. So there was no way that the Buddha could refuse to come if such a place was established. So he had 1,250 monks, the word, the Pali word for monk is bhikkhu, with him. Now with these numbers in Pali, we are not so sure that they are always correct. Many is always used in multiple, multiples of 50 or 500, so, but it's no use debating on that. So we assume maybe he really had 1,250 monks there. At least he had a large company of monks with him. And at the time, on the 15th day, Upositor, the full moon night of Komudi in the fourth month. Now, Komudi is, um, is the um, uh, month when the white lotus flower is supposed to bloom. I don't know whether it really does or not, but that's why it's got that name, Komudi, because the white lotus flower is supposed to bloom then. And that would be October, November. So at that time, King Ajat Ajatasattu of Magadha, the son of Queen Videha, was sitting on the upper terrace of his palace, surrounded by his ministers. And there the king uttered, the following joyful exclamation. How delightful, friends, is this moonlit night. How beautiful is this moonlit night. How lovely, how tranquil, how auspicious. Is there any recluse or Brahmin that we could visit tonight who might be able to bring peace to my mind? So he has exactly the same idea as we all have. Huh? He wants to find out how to get some peace in the mind. But he had a terrible reason for that. 
we all have our reasons for wanting a peace in the mind and it's a totally justified uh, endeavor to get peace in the mind but he had a most dreadful reason he had murdered his father now this is a um, very famous uh, story King Ajatasattu was the son of King Bimbisara now King Bimbisara was a contemporary of the Buddha, same age, exactly same age, and had been a follower of the Buddha ever since the Buddha had become enlightened, since they were both young men at the age of 35. King Bimbisara, having been a long-time follower of the Buddha, of course was steeped in the Dhamma and tried to live accordingly. So when his queen became pregnant with this baby, the court astronomers and uh, wise men predicted that this baby was going to kill his father and the queen wanted to have an abortion but the king did not allow that he said no that is not possible because uh, how do you know these things this is actually true and don't believe such things and uh, it's all right don't have an abortion so she tried anyway, but it didn't happen, and then he forbade it uh, to her that to do anything like that, and the baby was born. And the mother refused to have anything to do with that baby because she was afraid that this baby was really going to grow up into such a monster. But when she finally did see the baby, of course, she loved it just like mothers usually love their babies. And when the boy was of age, doesn't say exactly how old, but maybe 20, 21. He tried to kill his father. And it was found out. And the ministers wanted to um, punish him, put him into prison, put the boy into prison, and maybe even execute him. And the father dismissed all the ministers who wanted to punish the boy and kept only those who said no not to do it and then he said to the boy why do you want to kill me and the boy said or the young man by that time i want your kingdom so king bimbisara said it's all right you can have it so he gave it to him put him on the throne now the the story says that ayata satu had become friends with Devadatta. And Devadatta is very infamous. Famous and infamous. Devadatta was a Buddha's cousin, also exactly the same age, and had been a monk also as long as the Buddha. And he was jealous, jealous of the Buddha, and actually wanted to be the leader of the monks and nuns, wanted to be famous like the Buddha. But you can't want that sort of thing. Either you are or you aren't. You know, I mean, it's just not possible to do that. So, um, he was actually the instigator of this um, um, attempt at uh, murder. And when this young man then came to Devadatta and said, Now, look, I've got the kingdom. I've got what I wanted. Devadatta said, Ah, oh, your father won't let you keep that he'll go back on the throne, kill him. And uh, so another attempt was made. And again, it didn't work out because it was found out. So this time though, the, uh, the boy was, or the young man, had already got lots of ministers on his side. In other words, he had made sort of like a palace revolution and threw the father into prison. And then Devadatta said he should immediately kill him. And the boy said, no, I won't do that. I'll keep him in prison. And that was the time when Devadatta tried to kill the Buddha. And one of those attempts at killing the Buddha happened at Rajagaha. Rajagaha is the place where there's the vulture's peak that can still be seen today. It is a, a small mountain or a large hill 
And what uh, Devadatta did, he took a um, boulder and rolled it down when the Buddha was at the bottom of this mountain in order that he should be killed by that. But all it did was it grazed his um, heel. It didn't, it did draw some blood, but it never did any more damage than that. And at that time, Devadatta then went to the Buddha and made five requests. He said he would not try to take over the Sangha, but he wanted to make five requests. And if the Buddha did not agree to these five requests, then he would try to take over the Sangha. And the requests were that the monks and nuns should never have any place like a roof over their heads. They should always live out in the open. They should never have any uh, clothing, any robes. They should all be made out of rags, the robes. And they should uh, not eat any meat or fish. And... Um, Something else that you wanted. I should never eat food that was given to them by invitation, only eat it when they went on arms round. And um, shelters, railroads, arms round. Yes. And the Buddha refused all of that. He said, none of that is practical. So then uh, Devadatta tried again to kill the Buddha, but never succeeded. And in the end, at the end of his life, he was very sorry and tried to make amends, but he was unable to do so because he died before he was able to see the Buddha. He tried twice more to kill the Buddha. He tried once with... um, a company of um, a company of um, like soldiers using using their um, bows and arrows, putting them behind a, uh, a little grove of trees where they, he knew that the Buddha would come. But before anything happened, these soldiers got very remorseful and ran away and then he tried with a wild elephant tried to have the Buddha killed with a wild elephant and that didn't work either because the Buddha was able through his loving kindness to tame the elephant completely so that the elephant prostrated in front of the Buddha but Devadatta um, never got the never got the uh, uh, to be head of the Sangha although he did uh, was able to split the Sangha. He put a schism in the Sangha, was able to split it. But most of the monks and nuns went back to the Buddha and in the end he was unable to uh, make amends with the Buddha. So he was a friend of this unfortunate young man who had now become king and had thrown his father, King Bimbisar, who was quite old at the time, into prison. and was going to starve him to death. But the queen went into that prison of the king every day and brought some food. And when the uh, young man found out, then he forbade the queen to do that. And then the story says she anointed her whole body with oil and uh, um, herbs so that he could eat that. But... uh, he found out about that too and then forbade that and in the end he tortured the father and or had him tortured and then the father died and just as he died two letters were delivered to the young king and the first letter told him that a baby boy had been born to him his uh, queen had had a baby boy. And the minute he read that, he felt love for this baby boy. And he thought, oh, I mustn't let my father die. I will tell 
a prison guard to release him. And as he told them that, they said, but open your second letter. And when he opened the second letter, he saw that the father had just died. So there's no way he could release him anymore. And he went, then the story says he went to his mother and asked her whether his father had loved him. And she told him many instances of how the father had loved him. So from that moment on, he couldn't sleep anymore. Maybe he took catnaps, but he couldn't sleep properly anymore because he was so remorseful. And this is what's happening here on the terrace of his palace. He's sitting there in this very beautiful moonlit night, but he can't sleep. And so he's saying he would like to visit some recluse or some Brahmin that he would be able to bring peace to his mind. Because he was totally remorseful about his terrible deed, and his whole life, of course, was colored by that. Now he had several ministers sitting there and each of the ministers wanted now to propagate their own teacher. They wanted to explain that their teacher was the best because they thought they would have also advantages from that. So thereupon one of his ministers said, Your Majesty, there is Puranya Kasapa the leader of an order, the leader of a group, the teacher of a group, well-known and famous, a spiritual leader, whom many people esteem as holy. He is aged, long gone forth. Long gone forth means a monk for a long time. Advanced in years, in the last phase of life, your majesty should visit him. Perhaps he might bring peace to your mind. But when this was said, King Ayata Sattu remained silent. Other ministers said, Your Majesty, there is Makali Gosala, Ajita Kesa Kambala, Pakuda Kachayana, Sanyaya Bilataputta, and Niganta Nataputta. And they're all saying the same things about these teachers. Each one of the ministers, of course, has a pet teacher and thinks that's the one they should go to he should go to. Not only that the ministers actually do believe that this particular teacher is best, but also um, <clears throat> they think that if their teacher is chosen by the king, then they themselves will advance in their position. And the commentary says, the ministers thought, how the commentators know what the ministers thought is a mystery, <laughs> I mean, they were certainly not there. Today the king extols the knight in five ways. That is how nice the knight is, huh? Surely he wishes to approach some recluse or Brahmin, question him and hear his Dhamma. He will show great honor to that recluse or Brahmin whose Dhamma inspires his confidence. And it will be fortunate for the one whose recluse wins the support of the royal family. Having such aims in mind, each of the ministers thought, I will praise the reckless I support and go, taking the king along with me. Thus each one began to praise the reckless he personally supported. But whatever, uh, any one of these six, the king Ayata Sato remained silent. And all this time, Jivaka sat silently not far from King Ajatasattu. And then the king said to him, Friend Jivaka, why are you keeping silent? And Jivaka said, Your Majesty, the exalted one, the worthy one, the perfectly enlightened Buddha, together with a large company of 1250 bhikkhus, is now dwelling in our mango grove. A favorable report concerning him is circulating thus. The exalted one is the worthy one, perfectly enlightened, endowed with clear knowledge and conduct, accomplished, knower of the world, trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and men, enlightened and exalted. Your majesty should visit that exalted one. Perhaps if you visit him, 
he might bring peace to your mind. And the story then goes on to tell that Ajata Sattu knew those other teachers already. And that's why he's keeping silent, because he'd been to them. And this comes out a little later when he talks to the uh, Buddha. He'd been to or any, every one of them and had asked every one of them the same question. And ne- not one of them had been able to satisfy him, to show him a way to peace of mind. So he didn't want to argue with these ministers, because he thought, well, if he's going to, that comes out later too, if he's going to argue with them, this, this discussion is going to take even longer. So then, because Jivaka didn't say anything, he asked him, and then he is recommending the Buddha. Now, obviously, Ayatasattu didn't know the Buddha. He'd never been to see him. Although his father, King Bimbisara, had been a follower, he never went to see the Buddha, and the story says he didn't, because he was so ashamed of his deed. And he knew that his father and the Buddha had been close, so he was afraid to go there, because he thought the Buddha would scold him immediately and would tell him, you know, what a terrible deed he had done. It's interesting to note that everybody knew that he'd killed his father, but uh, there was no justice being meted out. A king, obviously, was like a dictator. I mean, there was nobody that was going to put him into prison. It's also interesting that in that particular dynasty, every son killed the father for five generations until the people of that uh, province, Magadha, got so tired of that that they killed the last king and put a different dynasty on the throne. (laughs) (laughs) Bimbisara was the first one to be killed. Ajatasattu got killed by his son. And then that son by the next one. Five generations. It will be... It says in the Bible something about seven generations, doesn't it? So maybe that's what is meant. So now when... Now, because these ministers are giving him the names of teachers whom he knows all, he's already heard all that, he now decides he is going to go and see the Buddha because there's nothing left. The others he knows already, they weren't of any use to him. So he says, get the elephant vehicles prepared, friend Jivaka. In those days, elephants were the most elegant thing to travel on. Not like we have these cars now. Yes, your majesty, Jivaka replied. He then had 500 female elephants prepared, as well as the king's personal bull elephant, and announced to the king, your majesty, your elephant vehicles are ready. Now you can do as you think fit. There's a quite uh, interesting about the the commentary says how Jivaka was... um, reacting to the Buddha. Uh, Jivaka was reacting and Ajatasattu was thinking how that had something to do with the excellence of the Buddha. It says, after hearing the statements of the other ministers, the king thought, I do not wish to hear the statements of those who are speaking. I wish to hear the statement of that one who is keeping silent. That This isn't helpful to me. And then he remembered, Jivaka is a supporter of the exalted Buddha, the peaceful one. And he himself, Jivaka, is also peaceful. Therefore, he sits silently. He will not speak to me unless I speak to him. The foot of the elephant must be grabbed while the elephant is trampling. So he must grab, must ask him. Thus he himself took the initiative in consulting and asked, Friend, why do you keep silent? And while each of these ministers praises the recluse he supports, you do not even open your mouth. Don't you support some recluse as they do? Or are you too poor? So he's sort of baiting him because it is a uh, good form in then and now in India that you have some spiritual person that you support. Didn't my father give you royalties? Or do you lack faith in anyone? So he's uh, uh, baiting him with these questions. And then Jivaka thought, ah, the king wants me to speak about the virtues of the recluse I support. This is not ti- no time for remaining silent. 
I should not speak about the virtues of the teachers in the way these men ministers spoke about the virtues of their recluses by first bowing to the king and then sitting down. So he rose up from his seat, bowed down to the ground in the direction where the Buddha was dwelling, lifted his hands to his head in reverential salutation and said, Great King, do not think that I approach any recluse indiscriminately. For when my teacher took conception in the mother's womb, when he emerged, when he made his great renunciation, when he achieved enlightenment, when he set in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, the ten thousand fold world system shook. So too, when he performed the twin miracle and descended from heavenly worlds, I will speak about the virtues of that teacher. Listen with a one pointed mind, great king. And having said this, he then began to speak. And he said what we heard already. And when Jivaka had finished explaining the meaning of each term, he said, Thus, great king, my teacher is a worthy one, perfectly enlightened. Perhaps if you visit him, he might bring peace. Speaking thus, he in effect says, Great king, even when questioned by a hundred persons like yourself, or by a thousand, or by a hundred thousand, the teacher has the power and ability to grasp their intentions and to answer them. You should approach, approach him confidently, great king, and ask your questions. And when the king heard this talk about the virtues of the Buddha, his entire body was immediately suffused with the five grades of rapture. Even though this Ajata Sattu had never meditated in his life and had such a terrible uh, background, uh, he got five grades of rapture. I'll read you what the five grades of rapture are. Momentary, minor, showering, uplifting, and pervading. It's all pity, huh? So, um, because he, he, um, this happened immediately, of course, he thought, well, this must be very important. I better go there. And, uh, of course, Jivaka himself, being a stream enterer, was able to put forth a very a strong vibration himself and talking about the Buddha in the most um, devoted terms and most loving way, that added to that then. So the king was affected by that. And so at that very moment, he became desirous to go to the, uh, to the Buddha. And he thought, if I'm to go to the Buddha at this time, there's no one apart from Jivaka who can get the vehicles prepared quickly enough. So he said, then get the elephant vehicles prepared, friend Jivaka. In those days, elephant vehicles were the best. And if one is going to see an important person, one must go in the best vehicles. It's like taking a Cadillac instead of just little, little, little Volkswagen or something. <laughs> and since he was a very rich king, a very powerful king, Magadha was a rich and powerful um, part of India, and Ayatasattu was a conqueror. He, is, although he went to the Buddha and was instructed by the Buddha in many different ways, he did not uh, stop uh, warfare. He continued with warfare. And he was a conqueror and conquered many of the surrounding uh, provinces and the, his kingdom became larger and larger. So he had um, many, many elephants, which is a sign of wealth. And if one is going to see the best person, one must go in the best kind of vehicle. And horse vehicles and chariots are noisy, and the sounds can be heard from the distance, but elephants proceed step by step, and one does not hear any sound. If elephants do not wear any chains or any bells, they are completely quiet. The only thing that one usually hears when they are approaching is because those that have been trained usually have a chain where they can, when they stop from where they can be chained to a tree. But, um, and those when they're in a procession, 
they are decorated with bells and things, but if they don't have any of that, they're completely quiet. You can hardly hear their footsteps, even though they're the heaviest animal that exists, you can hardly hear the footstep. You can feel it, because it makes the earth move, it shakes a little, but you don't hear it, you can feel it, it's a little shaking. So when in, in Sri Lanka there are many elephants uh, on, the, on the road, and when you can feel, when you're standing and you feel it's moving a little, you know, ah, the elephant is coming, you can look. So he thought that one should approach the peaceful Buddha in peaceful, quiet way, and so he ordered these elephants. Now, Jivaka undertook the preparation um, because he thought the king says he must be going at this time. So a king has many enemies, and if some obstacle should arise along the way, then people will blame me, this Jivaka, for taking the king out at an improper time. And they will blame the Buddha for giving Dhamma talk without regard for the time, because it's very late at night already. Therefore, I should arrange protection for the king, so that no one will blame either me or the Buddha. So, when supported by women, it looks more peaceful, Jivaka thought. So, he thought the king should go along happily, surrounded by his women. And Jivaka arranged for 500 female elephants to be prepared and had 500 of the king's women mounted on these. But he disguised them as men, carrying swords and spears in their hands, surrounding the king, so that uh, if there were enemies at night, that uh, they would be afraid to go and come near that. And then he thought, the king does not have the supporting conditions for gaining path and fruit in this present existence. Path and fruit means the uh, attainment of Nibbana in first, second, third or fourth step, stream entry, once returner, non-returner, Arahant. So he thought because, quite rightly, because he's killed his father, he doesn't have the conditions. So, but the Buddha explained Dhamma when they have seen the supporting conditions in their audience. Now, this is a very interesting because it's quite true what Jivaka says there or thinks there. The Buddha made a point of teaching Dhamma whenever he was aware of the fact that there was some person in the audience who had the almost immediate ability to become Sprementra. And that was one of the reasons also why the discourses were so powerful. Because he gave them the complete impetus so that a person who had the supporting condition, which was ready, in other words, mature, could do it. This happened constantly. There were many, many stream enters at the time of the Buddha. Of course, not uh, just monks and nuns, not at all. Um, the Buddha often said that one can go as far as non-returner quite happily in the household life. So, Jivaka now thinks that he has heard this, that the Buddha will teach when there are supporting conditions in the audience. But this king doesn't have a supporting condition. Obviously, he's killed his father, so he's not going to become Sri Mantra in this life. So, let me assemble a great multitude of people. Because Jivaka didn't know who had a supporting condition for stream entry. So he was going to get a whole lot of people together to go with the king so that then maybe amongst those many people, one would be a suitable one. For well, then the teacher, having seen someone with a supporting condition, will teach the Dhamma and that will be beneficial to the whole multitude. So he sent out announcements here and there and had it proclaimed. Today the king will go to see the exalted one. Let everyone protect the king according to his means. And Jivaka himself, having arranged the king's retinue, went along close to the king, thinking, if any danger arises, I will be the first to give my own life for the sake of the king. But there were so many torches, hundreds and thousands beyond limit.
that was a commentary. Now then, King Ayatas, Ayatasattu had 500 of his women mounted on the female elephants, one on each, while he himself mounted his personal bull elephant. With his attendants carrying torches, he went forth from Rajagaha in full royal splendor, setting out in the direction of Jivaka's mango grove. Now these torches, it's still at night. Even though Jivaka sent out announcement, he only did that around the palace, most likely, because the torches are always carried at night, and they are um, on long sticks with coconut oil, uh, filled with coconut oil on top, and lit, which lights up the night very nicely. Uh, today they're still being used for religious processions in Sri Lanka, especially when elephants are being used. And uh, the religious processions usually have elephants. Always have elephants, not usually, always. <laughs> and these are the torches which makes it look very beautiful because they throw light and shadow which is moving because the people who are carrying them are moving. And uh, because of the coconut oil and the deep container, they do stay alight for quite a long time. And this is what they were using to do this night journey to see the Buddha. When King Ajahsattu was not far from the mango grove, he was suddenly gripped by fear, trepidation and terror. Frightened, agitated and terror-stricken, he said to Jivaka, you're not deceiving me, are you, friend Jivaka? Now you can see being a king is not all that it's made out to be. They're uh, constantly afraid that somebody's going to um, um, kill them or do something to them because uh, it's almost they need a bodyguard like you know important people today also they need bodyguards <laughs> there are four kinds of fear mentioned here fear is mental anxiety well we know that Fear as knowledge, but then it's actually true that we know something is happening. Fear of a fearful object and fear as moral dread. The Buddha said moral dread and moral shame are the guardians of the world. So moral dread is a kind of fear which is useful. It's a kind of fear which is helpful because it prevents us from doing anything wrong. It is the fear of doing something which is unwholesome. And if we don't have moral, moral fear and moral shame, then we have got to live in a chaotic world. And that has happened innumerable times in humanity's history and in this century, many more times than one can count on fingers and toes. So as soon as moral dread and moral fear is abandoned, chaos reigns. So it's called um, Hiri Otapa, this is Otapa Baya, our conscience is active. We know that our conscience is telling us to abstain from that which is unwholesome. Unfortunately, this king didn't have much of a conscience when he was dealing with his father. But now his fear is totally different. His fear is of an object. And he's going to tell in a minute what he's afraid of. There's another way of looking at the word fear as knowledge, namely that, and this is a, one of the steps of insight, namely that when we have heard the Dhamma and have understood it well enough, then fear arises a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency because we are fearful 
that we haven't got enough time left in this life to make an end to all dukkha because nobody knows how long they're going to be around so that is also a useful fear a fear as a sense of urgency so here he's afraid of, a, of an object because he's afraid that this Jivaka is deceiving him you are not betraying me he says you aren't about to turn me over to my enemies how could there be such a large company of bhikkhus 1250 without any sound of sneezing or coughing or any noise at all so they've got as far as so that they uh, should be able to hear something and it's totally quiet and because he is very fearful because he's got lots of enemies uh, not just at the palace but amongst the conquered um, provinces so he's afraid of this silence and Jivaka says do not be afraid great king do not be afraid I'm not deceiving you or betraying you or turning you over to your enemies go forward great king go straight forward those are lamps burning in the pavilion hall there are lamps burning in the meditation hall There's more explained here about fear. Oh, because why did the king become afraid? He suspected Jivaka because of that quietness. And so Jivaka tells him, the Buddha is fond of quietness and he should be approached quietly so the king prohibited the playing of mu musical instruments because they had taken musical instruments with them so he forbade to forbid them to uh, play them and he also told all his um, company to not to speak loudly but he went along giving signals with a snap of his fingers and in the mango grove not even the sound of sneezing was heard and the and kings usually delight in sound and so he became un, more and more uneasy and he thought that Jivaka had been lying to him that there really were 1200 bhikkhus there and he thinks that Jivaka wants to become king and he wants to set up an army and wants to arrest him so you see he's making up all these things in his mind because he has done a thing like that he now sees the same in Jivaka he is um, um, suspecting him of treason because he himself of course had been uh, guilty of treason towards his father again another um, example of seeing in others exactly what we have in ourselves if we can get that through our minds once and for all that we only know in others what we have in ourselves we're never going to accuse anybody of anything again we're never going to have any kind of rejection or dislike of anyone because all we're doing is rejecting and disliking ourselves that's all we would never know what's going on in somebody else if we weren't doing the same thing so he thinks that this uh, Ijivaka, who is really having only his best interests at heart, is wants to um, uh, set up an army and arrest him. And this Jivaka, he has the strength, now the king is thinking this, of five elephants. And he's so close beside me, and there is not even a single armed man uh, near me. Oh, what harm has befallen me? And having become so much afraid, he could not conduct himself fearlessly. So he revealed himself to Jivaka. And Jivaka thinks, this king does not know me. He does not know that Jivaka cannot take another's life. If I do not reassure him, he will perish. And so he was reassuring the king. He says, go forward. And he says it twice so that the king will believe him and he shows him the lights in the pavilion hall 
and he says a group of thieves does not, thieves does not stay where lamps are burning you should go where you see those lamps great king so he's reassuring reassuring the um, the king that he can go there now King Ajatasattu, having gone by elephant as far as he could, dismounted and approached the door of the pavilion hall on foot. This is an interesting spot in India which can be visited. There's a little signpost there that says, this is as far as, as Ajatasattu went on the elephant. There's a little, <laughs> little sign there. Because then after that, the pathway becomes very narrow, and obviously no elephant could go there, it's much too narrow, and it goes, winds up to this Vulture's Peak. Vulture's Peak's not very high, but it does wind up towards it. So it says right here, this is where he stopped. Having approached, he asked Jivaka, but where, Jivaka, is the Buddha? And Jivaka said, that's the Buddha over there. He's the one sitting against the middle pillar, facing east in front of the company of the bhikkhus. Now, obviously, Ajatasattu had never met the Buddha because otherwise he would have known what he looked like. And also, he looked exactly to him, like all the other bhikkhus, because he had the same robes on and uh, his hair off and all that, so he looked just like everybody else. So here it says now what happened to him when he got near to the to the Buddha. As soon as the king dismounted from the elephant and set foot on the ground, the splendor of the exalted one suffused his body. Immediately his entire body broke out into a sweat. His clothes oppressed him so that he felt as if they should be removed. He remembered his own crime and great fear rose in him. He could not go directly to the Buddha, but took Jivaka by the hand and walked around, as if touring the monastery ground, saying, You have built this well, Jivaka. You have built this very well, because this was Jivaka's monastery. So he was afraid to go and see the Buddha right away. He had to sort of work up to it. And uh, so he walked around looking at everything Jivaka had done. Thus praising the monastery, he gradually approached the door of the pavilion hall. And then he says, Where is the Buddha? And, of course, obviously he didn't know. When he was young, he had seen the Buddha when he came to him along with the father, but afterwards, as a result of associating with evil friends, killing his father, sending assassins to work for Devadatta, or the the soldiers that were supposed to kill the Buddha with bow and arrow, they had belonged to Ayatasattu. They were his soldiers and also helping to set the elephant loose, and having thus become a great criminal, he never met the Buddha again face to face, and so could not recognize him. The Buddha sitting in the middle of the hall, surrounded by a company of bhikkhus, appeared like the full moon surrounded by the host of stars. He was adorned with special features of physical beauty, and he illuminated the entire monasteries with his six colored rays, now, six colored rays is a, um, has been said that that emanated from him the rainbow colors. And we can see in the Buddhist countries often Buddha statues that have the six colors of the rainbow, like a rainbow above the head. Whether this is so or not, I wouldn't have a clue. But this is what is said. So who would not have known him? Now, the king asks this maybe as a mannerism of sovereignty. It's the nature of royal families. Not knowing something, they still ask as if they do not... Knowing something, they still ask as if they do not know. But Jivaka heard the question and thought, Now, this king standing in front of the Buddha asks, Where is the exalted one? This is as if someone standing on the earth. Where to ask, where is the earth? Or as if someone looking up at the sky were to ask, where are the sun and moon? Or standing at the foot of Mount Sinero asking, where is Sinero? I will show him the Buddha. 
Making a reverential salutation towards the Buddha, he said, This is the Buddha, great king. And as the king surveyed the bhikkhus, wherever he looked, the company sat in complete silence. Not even one bhikkhu was playing with his hands or feet, or broke out into a cough. Not even one bhikkhu looked up at the king and his royal assembly standing in front of the exalted one, or at the retinue of notch girls adorned with all their ornaments. So it is questionable now where they dressed up like men with... Uh, uh, bows and arrows or where they dressed up as notch girls who knows anyway they apparently now they're dressed up with all their ornaments and the bhikkhus never looked at them all sat there looking only at the Buddha and the king gaining confidence at the sight of such peace again and again surveyed the company of bhikkhus sitting there with calm faculties like a clear lake free from mud and then he said may my son the prince Udayi Bada enjoy such peace as the company of bhikkhus now enjoy. So he is wishing this for his son, bodily, verbal and mental peace and peaceful conduct, which the company of bhikkhus enjoy. Unfortunately, that never took place. His son became a murderer, just like he was himself. And having seen this, a very beautiful sight of all these quiet bhikkhus he remembered his son because he loved his son but also because he was apprehensive about his son and desired peace for him because he had thought when my son will ask my father is still young where's my grandfather and hearing that your father killed him he might think then I shall kill my own father and rule the kingdom And thus apprehensive about his son, he spoke thus, desiring this peace for him. Yet so he said this, his son eventually killed him. And then it says that they were patricide in five generations. Ajatasattu killed Bimbisara, Udayi killed Ajatasattu, Udayi was killed by his own son, Mahamundika, and that one was killed by his son, Anuruddha, and Anuruddha was killed by his son Nagadasa and the citizens became so angry and thinking these kings destroy their own lineage what do we need them for and they killed the last one so now he has um, Jivaka has told him this is the Buddha And so then he is saying loudly, May my son, the prince, Udayibada, enjoy such peace as a company of bhikkhus now enjoy. And the Buddha said, Do your thoughts, great king, follow the call of your affection? Yes, sir, I love my son, the prince, Udayibada. May he enjoy such peace as a company of bhikkhus now enjoy. And then King Ayatasattu paid homage to the exalted one, reverently saluted the company of bhikkhus, sat down to one side and said to the exalted one, Venerable Sir, I would like to ask the exalted one about a certain point, if he would take the time to answer my question. And Buddha says, Ask whatever you wish to, great king. And then come the questions, what are the usefulness of the spiritual life? Continue tomorrow evening. (laughs) (laughs) it's a long discourse and it has many um, aspects which show us also the way the Buddha lived and the people approached him and it makes the Buddha come alive that he's not just a figurehead he's not just something that concerns meditation it is a great spiritual master who was able to live that great spiritual teaching and pass it on to people at that time and then forward up to our time. We're very fortunate that we have that opportunity. And the more we can identify with the idea that this is not two and a half thousand years ago 
because time is man-made it's all happening now it's all within one great ball of time there is no such thing as it's gone and it's going to be it's all now and within that when we can feel that this is all now we have a much better chance of understanding it of understanding it and then experiencing it and having the understood experience which changes our whole being our whole life our whole approach to everything completely turns it all upside down and changes it completely and the peace that this king is looking for for a very good reason obviously because he's totally without it this peace is possible completely and utterly if we can follow the guidelines and there be innumerable guidelines in this sutta we can be sure of that this is the sutta which goes from the beginning to the end and it actually is interesting also that the Buddha tells all these things to a person who cannot gain stream entry if you kill a, a father or mother in this lifetime stream entry apparently is um, impossible, it's blocked and yet he gives this king all the instructions because he says if he ha in the end he says if he hadn't killed his father he would have gone, become stream enterer but because first he has to get the resultants of that horrible deed and then after having had the resultants of that horrible deed he will eventually come back to the practice so even the resultants are impermanent. So you have now only received the background, but uh, patience, huh? Does anybody want to say, ask, add anything? Yes. First time I ever heard about this one specific and really doesn't have me live in it. To have what in it? To have me live in it. The yes. The story really came alive. And uh, what occurred to me was, in a way, even this introduction already gives you a lot of hope. Because, I mean, every day my ego murders my father, which is like, let's say, the chance to become alive. Every day my mm. ego does that. Over and over and over again. I mean, generation after, every day is a new generation. Yeah. And every day I manage to do that. And so now here, is so I my ego can't enter the stream. Is that what you said, stream entry? Yeah. And yet uh, there was this moment here that you provided for us that gave it seemed to give a new hope or a chance or something. Yes. I think I'm very grateful for that. Yes, that's quite true. Uh, you're absolutely correct. And you know you must also look at it this way. If you know which you do, apparently, because you are subtle, that your ego is murdering the chance of the stream entry. That's already a big step ahead. Most of the people on this planet don't have a clue about that. You see, you know already that this is what's happening, that as long as our ego is in there, we don't have that uh, possibility of the enlightenment moment because the enlightenment moment doesn't have the ego in it. We know that already. That is already you know, halfway of the practice. So you're very fortunate. It's very good. <laughs> Anything else? Anybody have any? Yes. Um, yesterday you uh, spoke of how many arahants there were in the time of the Buddha and how few there are now. Um, why is that? <laughs> well, the Buddha made a prophecy and he said that from his Parinibbana, the day of his death, the um, gradually moral conduct will get less and less. And because of that, because of moral conduct diminishing in the world, the concentration will diminish. And because of the concentration diminishing, 
inside wisdom will diminish. These are the three parts of the teaching. And it will take about 5,000 years after his death and then the words anicca dukkanatta impermanence and satisfactoriness and qualessness will not be heard again until the next Buddha arises. In other words, the whole teaching is going to be dead until the next Buddha arises. And there is a commentary prophecy in addition to that it's actually in the Visuddhimagga that within that 5,000 years exactly in the middle of that there'll be a hundred years in which the Dhamma will take an upswing an upsurge and exactly 100 years and then it will diminish again until it's totally finished we are in the 34th year of those hundred years so we have an enormous chance if we can see the urgency if we have fear um, of the results of non-practice that brings about the samvega, the urgency um, the reason can only be described as the constant pendulum action of the whole universe it contracts and expands contracts and expands so we came to a peak maybe at the Buddha's time and then it falls down again comes to peak again and falls down again those people who were ready to be enlightened probably got born at the same time as the Buddha so there were uh, numerous arahants it is uh, said 500 but um, maybe who knows and uh, today sure there are some yes few and far between and only an arahant knows an arahant so <laughs> there are there are some one can sort of uh, assume that's about the best one can do and the Buddha also gave a gave discourse which is uh, somewhat along those lines quite interesting uh, where he said because of the lack of moral conduct lack of um, moral behavior uh, the lifespan of people is going to be reduced now, the, uh, the lifespan will be so far reduced that people will, in the end, be mature at 10 years of age and uh, then die shortly after. So, um, the, uh, the whole life energy is going to become less and less and then it's going to take an upsurge again. The, uh, the only value that has for us that I can see is that it's going to urge us to do something now and not wait eons until the next Buddha arises and who knows how long an eon is <laughs> <laughs> anything else oh, on these early deaths in a way that's happening now too because of um, young people dying of AIDS Hmm. yes uh, it doesn't look too good does it the whole thing it's, uh, it's possible to bring about a self transformation through the practice but uh, the uh, prophecies may be quite uh, correct if we look at them in a more general context we'll do a guided loving kindness meditation now in order to get started please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments
And now think of all the good things in your life that you have reason to be grateful for. Think of all that which comprises your life, which is good, comfortable, uplifting, helpful, beautiful, think of all these things, people, situations, possessions, accomplishments, and let the gratitude, uh, gratitude arise in your heart. Fill your heart with gratitude. And let it overflow so that you're completely bathed in it, bringing joy and contentment. Think of your parents and all the things you can be grateful for that they have provided for you. They've given you life and support and you were too small to look after yourself. Remember all the good things you have received. Fill your parents with your gratitude. Let them feel it. Let your heart speak to them. Think of those people who are nearest and dearest to you, those you might be living with, 
think of all the things that you have reason to be grateful for to these people or that person. Feel the gratitude in your heart and then fill the other person's heart with your gratitude. Think of all your good friends. Let gratitude arise in you, that they are your friends, part of your life, that you can call on them. Let them feel your friendship, your gratitude. Fill them with these feelings, embrace them with your gratitude. Think of your neighbors at home, the people you work with, people you meet in the shops and offices on the street and your travels. Embrace them all with gratitude that they're part of your life. That they have a connection with you, a relationship which is supportive. Realize all the things that you can be grateful for to them. Remember incidents.
think of anyone towards whom you might have a grudge, resentment, dislike, or towards whom you feel quite indifferent. Remember anything that you can be grateful for to that person. And then fill him or her with your gratitude. Surround and embrace that person with gratitude. Think of all the people who are assembled here in this room and feel gratitude towards each one for being your companion on the spiritual path and supporting you with his or her practice. Let the gratitude flow out of your heart to each one's heart. And now think of all the people that have ever touched your life and how you can be grateful to them. Remember all the good things that have happened all the help given. And fill all these people who have ever touched your life or are still touching it with your gratitude. Fill their hearts. Embrace them with it.
Now put your attention back on yourself. Become aware of the joy that comes from giving to others. And be aware of the contentment that comes from being grateful for what there is. Fill yourself with contentment from head to toe. Surround yourself with joy. Sitting in it, well protected. May beings everywhere experience gratitude in their hearts.